Yeah. First, let's acknowledge, I mean, firms like Mulvaney who are profited, profiting massively from this trade. I mean, I think they're up, correct me if I'm wrong, north of 120% in Q1, a huge percentage of which is, is driven by cocoa. And I think it, it shows the dispersion between classical trend following and, and more quantitative trend following where classical trend following managers tend to allocate a certain amount of capital to a trade and let that trade grow, whereas quantitative managers allocate a certain amount of risk budget in a, in a quantitative sense. And so what you've seen is as Coco went to the moon, so did its volatility, which meant for more quantitative traders, that position size got smaller and smaller. And if you actually look at the open interest in Coco over time, it peaked and has since declined, even though that trend got stronger. And so I think you can see a lot of quantitative traders haven't necessarily captured the fullness of the trend because they didn't do what more classical trend followers have done since the seventies, you know, really doing that sort of outlier hunting type trade. So I think it just highlights again, in theory, we're all trend following, but the ways in which trend following is done can lead to massive dispersion. And, and one of the questions we received all throughout Q1 was, well, if you're missing these trades like cocoa, or I think wheat was another really big short in Q1 that, that played well or long crypto, you know, if you're not trading those markets, can you still replicate the performance of the industry at large? If you're looking at returns like the Barclays top 50 or, or this, or the SOC gen trend index or the broader SOC gen CTA index. And I, and I think the results are, are an emphatic. Yes. One of the simple tests I did is I said, well, rather than seeing whether the process works from, you know, there's a lot of statistical noise, but like if I just had a crystal ball and I could look forward in time and use just nine key futures markets, things like U.S. equities and gold and oil and sort of the, the major markets. And I wanted to replicate the future returns of something like the SOC Gen Trend Index. How close could I get? Because in theory, that SOC Gen Trend Index is made up of players who are trading things like Coco. And the answer was with the crystal ball, with just nine factors, you could get very, very close to replicating those returns. So, you know, I think there's a lot of potential reasons why that's the case, which I'm sure Adam probably has. Well, what does that mean when you get close to replicating the returns? Yeah. So, like so, so basically, like as a very simple test, what I did is I said, you know, February was a month, for example, where Coco spectacular returns. I looked at the SOC Gen trend index, daily returns of the SOC Gen trend index, and I said, let me formulate one portfolio, looking at those four returns, let me use these nine futures markets and come up with a replicating portfolio that I'm going to assume I'm going to hold constant throughout that whole month just to try to track that index closely. And the daily returns were very, very close. The daily correlation was spot on. The total return of the period was very close. In other words, you know, suggesting there wasn't a huge amount of change in the replicating portfolio over that period of what it took to track that index, but also that you didn't need to trade anything more than these nine major contracts to have actually replicated the returns. Again, if you had a crystal ball, we don't always have a crystal ball. Crystal ball. Or if you do, mine's pretty cloudy. But it wasn't like not having Coco was not meaningful in terms of not being able to realize the result. Yeah. So, I mean, one, first of all, it's like one month, right? So it's one, one major trend breakout. Coco. By the way, I should mention March was the same. So February and March, same, same. I think this also illustrates that most of the Q line, right? The trend index and the CTA index are both, they track the largest managers. Several of these managers are in the billions of AUM, right? And so, and, and you know, they may trade a smaller number of markets, you know, not all large Trend followers trade 400 markets. Some of them trade much less. Like, you know, Dunn is on the record as trading a more limited universe of markets, right? But when you trade a lot of markets or when you're very large size, you're going to be constrained in the amount of capital that you're going to be able to deploy to any single instrument in the portfolio, right? So it's just not going to, on an isolated basis, have that much impact on this large, you know, AUM weighted index, right? Obviously going to wreak havoc on the dispersion of the funds within the index over that time frame, because there's going to be some funds that have 
relatively small investment universes. You know, they trade only a couple dozen securities, for example. Like Mulvaney is kind of on the record is they only trade like less than 30 markets, right? Coco is one of them. Well, if you trade less than 30 markets and one of the markets you trade has a bonanza trend, and like you say, you don't scale back your risk as the ball of that trend takes off. And as that position in your portfolio begins to represent an excruciatingly large amount of the total portfolio, you know, you can envision a over two or three months with a trend as large as the cocoa trend. You put the trend on at a certain level of risk. Two weeks later, or three weeks later, the position has grown massively relative to all the other positions in the portfolio. It may even represent like be larger than the portfolio was before you put it on that single position. And now that position is completely wagging the, the dog of the entire portfolio, right? So you've got managers like this, that, you know, they happen to trade the market that, that broke out. They caught the trend. They didn't scale back the risk. And then you've got these multi-billion dollar funds that, you know, may trade cocoa. It's one of a few hundred positions or because they're so large, it actually can only be a very small proportion of their total portfolio, et cetera. And that will dictate the relative performance within that index in that time period, right? Yeah. So there's, there's a, a lot, there's a lot of luck in the surface. There's well, a lot of luck in there. And I, I think something that's tragically underreported is the fact that Coco, before this occurrence, didn't trend. It is yeah. one of the worst trending assets for consideration. So how many people were still getting their face ripped off trying to get a trend in Coco when it didn't happen? And what were the deleterious effects of getting chopped and sliced and diced while trying to follow a trend following situation in Coco for 20 years? It's quite possible you just made back all of the money that you lost over a couple of decades of trying to follow a trend in Coco and have been losing two, three, four, five, six percent a year hidden in the context of your other assets, right? So when you look at Coco and you look at the personality of Coco, it had not trended for a couple of decades. 